Thank you. Can we go to the first slide, please? Thank you. I want to talk to you about the next phase of our social evolution. Uh, the nation state has been the dominating way that individuals organize themselves worldwide for the past 500 years. And my thesis is that we are now entering a new phase of our social evolution, which is going to be what I call the network society. We are all accustomed to the exponential changes that we see around us, and these changes are the basis of social emancipation, rather than the other way around. The dreams of Egyptian slaves as uh, by night in the evening they were uh, trying to understand whether the world could work differently achieved nothing exactly because the technological basis were not there in order to do so. What we are seeing around us now are due to the fact that we are now capable of organizing ourselves, we are capable of communicating, we are capable of executing on the scientific achievements that we have created. The 10,000 years of history uh, characterizing uh, the technological human society created what uh, Crutzen, a Nobel Prize winning uh, chemist, calls the Anthropocene. And it is actually an unsustainable uh, rapid change that we must understand much better. Actually, the only thing differentiating us from the dinosaurs is that we use telescopes. But are we? Both uh, metaphorically and concretely. Are we looking out at the asteroid that is coming to hit us? Are we applying rationality, the tools of science, at the degree that we need in order to understand what we need to do? The hierarchical organizations that we have developed can achieve certain breakthroughs, and they have, but they are not necessarily the right response to everything around us. And both in the lives of individuals, in the lives of enterprises, and in the lives of larger organizations, cities, regions, and countries around us, new network-based organizations are taking the place of what was coming before. Let me illustrate to you the eight pillars of the network society through very concrete examples of what I'm talking about and why this change is, in fact, unstoppable. In energy production, we see the power of renewable energies, most specifically solar energy, that is distributed and decentralized, contrary uh, to carbon, contrary to gas or nuclear plants that are centralized. In manufacturing, 3D printing is bringing distributed manufacturing whose power of uh, allowing complex designs in the hands of everybody and it is not dependent on the control of capital uh, in food production, plant labs, hydroponics, vertical gardens. In the near future, 3D printing of meat itself uh, is completely changing the parameters and the equations behind agriculture. Personalized health is distributing the possibility of preventative medicine, putting in the hands of individuals the power of controlling their uh, parameters of health rather than being an industry thriving on illness. Massive online open courseware and other ways of distributing access to knowledge globally is making sure that the university model is not the sole one capable of managing access to education and knowledge. In finance, cryptocurrencies represented chiefly by Bitcoin, but also the next generation of solutions like Stellar, Ethereum, and others are eliminating the needs for central authorities controlling access to banking, finance, financial services. And in security, we have trust platforms like Airbnb or the car sharing services, Uber, that are much better in mediating relationships among individuals than not traditional police forces intervening after the fact. 
policymaking itself must change how we design, deploy, adapt uh, in our local, regional, and national uh, uh, levels, the policies driving our decisions. So you see how all these forces together are really not a fad, they are not a coincidence, they belong to a big wave of decentralization and distribution of traditionally centralized and hierarchical activities of the nation state. And the Network Society project, which I am sharing with you, is developing toolboxes for acting on this. Because as these activities are becoming more and more visible, there is a spiking immune reaction from the forces uh, of the incumbents. Bureaucracies, whether governmental or within the enterprise, are extremely good. They have evolved in order to protect themselves, in order to make sure that they can resist change because they want to survive. They want to resist the disruption. And this resistance dictates uh, messages that uh, highlight the uh, precaution, uh, they say. Let's make sure that the consumer is protected. Let's make sure that we don't underestimate the negatives. But actually, uh, what is happening very often is that behind these protective messages, there is a sensation of panic because of the unstoppable nature of the change that is coming. And this panic is generating in the regulatory bodies, in the organizations within uh, corporations, an overreaction. And this overreaction is very, very similar to what happens in the body when the immune system actually makes mistakes, like in an asthmatic attack, like in allergic attacks, like in HIV AIDS, uh, when actually the immune system stops working. Let me give you two, three examples. Uh, in the uh, island of Hawaii, it is required that solar panels be connected to the uh, island's grid, but when the utility company cannot take the uh, peak power generated anymore, installation of solar panels stops. Or uh, the 23andMe episode where, just like uh, Martin Luther translating the Bible for anybody to be able to access it, 23andMe is told that we cannot read the sacred texts of our DNA without the mediation of the physician's priesthood. And, of course, uh, the New York State proposed legislation uh, for Bitcoin, which is regulating Bitcoin even more than not what is being done with traditional banks. However, we technologists who understand that technology is not a zero-sum game, it is not a balanced uh, good and bad, but there is a positive view, can espouse the precautionary, uh, proactionary uh, principle which enables us to embrace the new possibilities much faster. We can overcome traditional differences. We can uh, embrace new ways of organizing that implement our policies much better. And the Network Society project that I'm talking to you about embraces this, illustrates this, and I want to invite you to visit natsoc.org in order to learn more. Thank you, David. <laughs> okay. We have a few minutes for questions. Anyone? Here, a question in the back. Brian Long. Uh, as we, are we on? Yeah. Uh, as we move into this network society, um, we're inevitably going to have a greater and greater divergence of people who are on this singularity, um, who are being educated as you, who, who understand what's happening at this frontier, which is happening faster and faster and faster, and the majority of people who don't really have a clue of what's happening. Can democracy survive in that kind of an environment where 
most of the people don't know what's going on and other people are super skilled at manipulating people's emotions? So uh, uh, three answers. Um, uh, SU's exclusive approach rather than inclusive approach in this sense is fatally wrong. Uh, because we want to invite uh, uh, everybody here, but seven billion people don't fit in this room. Um, second answer, representative democracy cannot survive um, because ignorant people are easily manipulated uh, to vote against their own interests. And it is happening very, very frequently at an increasing rate. Uh, direct democracy, uh, however, uh, requires a level of participation that the majority of people is uh, not ready, are not ready to, uh, to make. Uh, third, uh, the Facebook experiment uh, showed a lot of people who were not aware that uh, uh, computers are not only good at sequencing and printing DNA, uh, computers are very good or starting to be very good at reading and programming our emotions as well. So as long as we face that fact and we understand that our memetic future is being designed together by people and computers, then we have a chance of, of being aware of what is going on. We have another quick question from Yuri. Uh, I have a question about uh, this peer-to-peer uh, -peer movement decentralization. I see the same thing. But the point is, the back-end uh, systems, they consolidate in power. So on the one hand, you have consolidation. On the other hand, you have fragmentation. Uh, let, let, so how would Yeah, let me, uh, let me give you uh, two answers to that, OK? Um, I think that the Internet of Things can kill Google, and should, uh, because the centralized paradigm that Google represents uh, is corrupting. Uh, NSA is chiefly enabled by the fact that there is a big haystack to take advantage of. Uh, and uh, and it, it shouldn't be that way. And I think Google realizes that too because they purchased Nest. Uh, and, uh, you know, just like the, um, um, the Large Hadron Collider throws away 99% of the data uh, they generate and only analyze what they uh, think they know matters, uh, we have to stop pretending that a bigger haystack will uh, allow us to find better needles. Um, and the second uh, uh, point is that ISIS have just uh, announced that they will use diaspora for their social media communications. Yes, distributed systems are here, and they are superior uh, for good and bad than not centralized ones. And Facebook should also, uh, uh, as a consequence, adapt to this new future. Let's thank David Orban again. Thank you.